Hi everyone, it's Dr. Shanika here, author of Power to Heal Your Heart, the book that is actually really helping people hear the, heal their souls as they pursue their walk with Christ. So listen, Heart Check University is starting up again in February, February 7th to be exact, and we are going for another 12 weeks of healing. So I wanted you to get um, just a little preview from the book. I had some pastors talk about the book and I wanted you to get a chance to hear their perspective on um, some of the chapters of the book. So over the next few weeks, we'll be doing Heart Check Mondays and you'll have an opportunity to hear from these pastors. I hope this blesses you. Take care. Sean to Pastor Sean to our broadcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanika. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you tonight. Amen. Good to have you. Good to have you. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All yours. Well, bless, bless the name of God. It is a joy to be with you. Uh, I want to say good evening to everybody. And uh, I, it's, it's, I see the excitement. I see, I sense the expectation. There's such an expectation in this space uh, for what God will do. And I just want to honor um, the gift of God in Dr. Shanika. Um, Dr. Shanika is an amazing leader. Um, first of all, um, she scares me in a good way. She scares me in a good way. Because I've never met anybody who like writes a book every week. Um, she's, she's just so gifted. There's so much in her. You all come on now. And it's not just like a book, but it's, it's a major, you know, word like revelation from God as she just bursts these things. I mean, she's just, she's an amazing gift. And, uh, there are a lot of people who are saying things, but they don't necessarily have things to say. You have to pay attention to the people in the space. Sometimes the people who are talking aren't necessarily the people who have things to say. And um, after you've been through that a little bit, you begin to discern um, that there are people who have been assigned by God to our moment to say things to us um, that God would use prophetically. And I appreciate the fact that she integrates all of her lived experience in order to speak through us and to us uh, through all of her gifts. So I wanna honor you um, for how you've allowed God to use you and uh, how you allow God to speak through your experience and for how you pour out, all right? So yeah, thank you for that. Um, it is inspiring and it is uh, challenging and it is encouraging and it's just downright scary because I mean, I just am looking at you like, Lord have mercy. You, you, you didn't put out like, 25 books this year and it took me 10 years to finish this one <laughs> so it's amazing and i celebrate and honor you um i want to say uh, again how blessed i am to be here and i see all of your comments um tonight uh it, it's interesting that you pray that this would be targeted um tonight i have a very very peculiar way um, that I feel that the Lord has given me to deliver this assignment. Um, uh, I, I, I talk out of my lived experience a lot. Um, and uh, so tonight, um, I want to sort of talk from the, the topic wound care. Um, and I, I want to talk about and begin by telling you the tale of two wounds in my life. The first um, is, and it's interesting because I, I was facilitating communion um, at the church. Uh, Janika and I both uh, came from the same church, Salem Baptist Church in Chicago. Um, by the way, when you grow up Baptist, what they teach you how to teach is, you know, you, you preach three points, you open up with a story and you close with a story. It's not gonna go like that tonight. Um, but uh, so I was doing communion, I was leading communion 
um, in my church. And uh, the, the day I was up, I was, I was talking about this story of how I had sustained an injury once when I was serving in Detroit. And I was relating that to the work that Jesus has done for us. And this injury is an injury that I sustained 17 years ago. Um, lo and behold, I would find out later that week, this was about a month ago, I would find out later that week that I had sustained almost the exact same type of injury in my other hand. So I'll tell you about the first wound and I'll tell you about the second wound. And I'll talk to you about why I wanna to talk to you tonight about wound care. The first injury, I was on my way, I was working with a church plant and I was uh, a passenger in a car. There was someone else driving this car. We were driving on the expressway going to pick up some supplies for the church that we were serving at the time. And it was a snowy day in Detroit and we were driving on the expressway and the expressway had not been plowed. Uh, if any of you know anything about the state of Michigan, there are certain states that just don't believe in salt and they don't believe in snow plows. If you're in California, you don't know anything about what I'm talking about. Uh, but when it snows and when you're from Chicago, you just expect to see snow plows and salt. You expect people to remove snow because snow tires are bad. So we're driving down this expressway and uh, the person driving the car that I'm in is going pretty fast. And we're in the, the far right lane where cars are coming onto the expressway. And, and we notice that there's a car that's coming onto the expressway, hits a patch of snow, turns sideways into our lane, maybe a few seconds before we hit the car. Impact, boom. I stretch my right hand out like this. That was my initial reaction. The airbag pops out, jams my hand back. I feel pain in my finger, my middle finger in my hand. The next thing I know, there's an ambulance that comes and I go to the hospital. I sit in the emergency room. The hospital attending doctor comes, they take x-rays and the doctor uh, tells, me, um, uh, tells me that my finger is sprained. My finger is sprained, wraps it up, I go home. <clears throat> About four weeks later, I am talking to a friend of mine who is a doctor. He looks at my hand and he says, your finger is not sprained, your finger is broken. I say, oh, this is good to know. So how do I fix it? because I could not move my finger the way I was used to moving my finger. He said, well, at this point, it's likely that we would have to break it. Your doctor would have to break it and reset it. And I said, no, no, that's not going to happen. And he said, well, then you're probably going to lose the motion in that hand that you've had before. I said, that's just fine. I'll live with that. Um, so to this day, I don't write well with this, that I'm right-handed. I don't write well because of that injury, because I went to the doctor whom I trusted with my pain and they misdiagnosed what was going on, told me that I had a sprain when I had a fracture they could have treated it properly, but they did not help me to know what needed to happen so that I could care for my wound well, okay? So that was 17 years ago. Fast forward. My wife and I, we recently uh, <clears throat> purchased a house and um, we're in this new house and we're moving in and I'm in the office and there is a bug on the ceiling. My daughter is three years old and she is afraid of bugs. This is 2020, this is about a month ago. And so she sees the bug and she goes, daddy, kill it, kill it, kill it. I step into a chair 
to try to squash the bug. Lose my balance in the chair. I'm flailing to catch my balance. Bang my left hand against a wall. When I bang my left hand against the wall, I feel pain in my hand. Immediately, it begins to swell up. I go to urgent care and the urgent care doctor says, your thumb is sprained. I say, okay. They gave me a, you know, a, a splint to put on my hand. And they said, if it's not better in a week or so, come back. A week went by. I said to myself, looked at this hand, and it, it occurred to me that this experience was familiar. I decided I was not going to go back to the urgent care. I decided to call my primary and ask for a referral to an orthopedic specialist. I call an orthopedic specialist. They refer me to somebody who specializes in hands. I go to this person, he says, your hand, your thumb is not sprained. You tore a ligament. And when you tore the ligament, you fractured the bone, okay? So this is that hand, okay? So what he then proceeded to do was to properly wrap it and said, now what I want you to do is I want that to rest and then come back in six weeks and then we'll explore options. One option would be therapy. The other option would be surgery. Okay. I want to help you differentiate between these two wounds. In one situation, I went to people I thought I could trust and asked them to help me identify the root of my pain. They told me something that I accepted as true because I believed that they knew what they were doing with my pain. I walked away only to realize that they had mistreated and misdiagnosed my pain, which caused further immobility and has left me with a decision, left me with a decision. Now I would need to embrace more pain in order to possibly recover mobility. The time I chose to deny the pain and now I've lost that level of mobility. Fast forward now in the future, I'm going through the exact same thing and I have a decision to make. And I believe that there are many people in the body of Christ, there are many people in the kingdom uh, who are dealing with pain and dealing with hurt and dealing with wounds and dealing with different types of issues. And you have gone to people and you've gone to sources and you've gone into spaces where you believed that you would receive the help and the healing and the care and the treatment that you would expect to receive only to have happen that your wound and your pain was misdiagnosed, causing further complication, further pain, further immobility, further distress, further discouragement which as you move throughout life creates the complication now that when you have new pain, you don't know where to go and who to trust. So as I'm reflecting on Dr. Shanika's chapter, book chapter seven, um, where she's talking about the perfect storm, okay? And she's talking about bitterness, anger, resentment and unforgiveness. The, the interesting thing about these um, emotions is that these emotions all hover around wounds that we really don't know how to treat. These all have to do with injuries that we've sustained in life that we are not aware of 
How do we heal these wounds? How do we recover from these? How do we treat them? And what happens over time is that as we collect injury, as we collect injuries that cause bitterness, that cause offense, that cause unforgiveness, we begin to respond in ways that further immobilize us. So there are many of us that have been immobilized in our relationships. We have been immobilized in our marriages. We have been immobilized in our careers. We have been immobilized in our ministry. We can't pray about certain things and we don't know why. Uh, we cannot worship and we don't know why. We cannot move forward in the things that God's called us to do and we don't know why. We have a limited range of motion in certain areas of our life and we cannot understand what it is. At the same time, there's a root of bitterness and a root of offense and a root of unforgiveness and a root of resentment that's operating in our life that we have a splint around when we really need surgery. So what I want to do is I want to dive a little bit in because across 17 years, and I just want to be a little bit transparent, maybe opaque. <laughs> uh, I want to be a little bit transparent because um, this has been an illustration for me. It's no accident. I don't believe it's any accident. I, I, now, I, I don't, I, now, I won't go so far as to say that the Lord saw fit that I would climb up in a chair <laughs> Kill a bug. <laughs> there is bug spray. I learned an important lesson. All bugs matter from now on. Okay, so that's that's one lesson I learned. Uh, but I do believe that it is no accident um, when when the Lord allows us to repeat certain pain. Um, the Lord, in His mercy, is trying to help us come to a place of clarity about the healing that we actually need. And so it's no accident that as I've been dealing with this issue, I've also been dealing and digging into, even as I finished my book, dealing and digging into issues in my soul that I've ignored for years. And so um, I believe that we're in a moment, we talk about healing, I believe we're in a moment in a space of time where God is challenging us to say that the ways that we've treated our wounds to this point are no longer acceptable. It is not optional for us to continue to take an aspirin for things that require surgery. It is not acceptable for us to self-medicate things that requires surgery. It is no longer acceptable for us to try to self-diagnose or self-prescribe. We've got to think differently about our wound care. Can I speak to you very truthfully? There are some things that we've been casting out that we need to process out. There are some things that we've been processing out that we need to cast out. We have to sharpen our discernment around what is the actual nature of the wound that we're dealing with. Some of us have been operating as if our souls are sprained when they are actually fractured. And fractures require a different level of intention. So I, I want to, first of all, uh, talk a little bit about, this is unusual, I told you it's gonna be unusual. I first of all want to talk about, I need to exegete this a little bit. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the specific types of wounds that I think we need to examine and then bring us to how we need to care for them, okay? 
the, the first type of wound that I think we need to examine is the type of wound that actually comes from self-injury. Um, many of us have wounded ourselves. Uh, you've heard plenty of sermon and plenty of message and plenty of teaching about people, you know, who have wounded you. You know, that's, that's a very popular message in the church. You know, my enemies. Oh, God's going to get my enemies. Every enemy that come across you. Every Pharaoh that's come after you. These enemies that you have seen, all the Jebusites and the Hittites. We need to talk about the Meite. The Meite. We need to talk about the ways in which, listen to me, we need to talk about the ways in which the trauma that we've experienced has caused us to internalize our own self-injuring practices, our own self-injuring behaviors, our own self-injuring identity, okay? That have opened up our souls to demonic forces, right? Because, uh, the only way that a demonic force can attach itself to you is if there is a context within you that gives that demonic force room to operate. So you have a trauma of abandonment. And rather than allowing God to heal that trauma, recognize that trauma, name that trauma, what we do is we allow the self-injuring practices to continue. And so we set ourselves up. So many of us injure ourselves by repeating in our romantic relationships the things that we learned in our childhood. So in other words, we date our dads and we date our moms and we, find ourselves in employment situations where our boss is our abuser. And we do this to ourselves because we have internalized our own injuring nature, okay? So we operate like the gathering demoniac. So we operate in such a way that we are cutting ourselves. And we look at that and we go, oh my God, that's so strange. That's a demonic spirit. But that's also the same spirit that causes us to enter into relationships that cut emotionally. It is the same spirit that causes us to enter into situations that cut us financially. It is the same spirit that causes us to internalize an identity where we stay in situations longer than we should. Where we end up in abusive and toxic environments. Why? Because there's something that we have internalized in our own soul that makes us believe that that's what we deserve. So we got to deal with self wounds, okay? We got to deal with self wounds. Secondly, we have to deal with systemic wounds, okay? Um, and I know that there are people in this space who operate in deliverance, who move in deliverance, who, who move in the prophetic. And I thank God um, because that movement um, saved my life, changed my life, transformed my life. Um, had it not been for the fivefold ministry, I would be a mess. So um, I thank God for people who operate in deliverance. Here's my disappointment. My disappointment is, I think we talk a lot about healing and deliverance on micro levels and not enough on macro levels. 
I think we don't talk enough about the ways in which we have permitted systems and structures to exist that cause and perpetuate injuries in our families, in our communities. So generations of people that have been on welfare, generations of people that repeat cycles of abuse and trauma, generations of communities where you drive through communities and you literally see people experiencing the same conditions that they were experiencing 10 years ago. Systemic, what's happened is there are systemic forces that are causing wounds and there are systemic spirits. And we don't talk about it enough that there are systemic assignments, that there are territorial spirits that have taken shape in our communities, that have taken shape in our cities, that have taken shape, that have taken shape in our neighborhoods, that have taken shape in regions whose assignment is to cause injury to the region. So let's go back to the Gadarene demoniac. What, does the, what do the spirits say when they identify themselves as legion? When Jesus says, come out of the man thou unclean spirit, and they know that they've got to come out of the man because Jesus has cast them out. What do they ask Jesus? They say, please let us stay in the region because the demonic assignment was never about just the man. Please hear me. Your wounds are not just about you. Please hear me. The ways in which the enemy has tried to injure and wound you is not just about you. It is about your family. It is about your bloodline. It is about your neighborhood. It is about all of the people who have been called and anointed on your block. The enemy knows that if you connect, it's about the people that you are connected to and assigned to. It is about the group of people in your generation. God does not when God births movements, he births them through groups of people, not just individuals. So please understand that when God anoints an individual, he anoints an individual for a group of people. He anoints an individual that's going to be connected to a group that's going to birth a movement and raise a movement. So when you, watch this, when the enemy attacks an individual, the enemy is attacking an individual because the enemy seeks to attack a people. So we're so busy in churches casting out demons out of individuals. And we're so busy in churches seeking healing for individuals. And we're missing the fact that it's not just this one individual who's dealing with anxiety, but there is a regional systemic curse of anxiety over this entire system. And it is intentional and it is deliberate because we, the enemy knows, because the enemy is strategic and the enemy is systemic and the enemy is structured. The enemy knows if he can curse the city of Chicago with a spirit of anxiety, he knows that he can limit the intercessors and the travailers and the women who have been anointed anointed to raise up through their prayers, leaders and entrepreneurs. He knows that. So what does he do? He afflicts an entire region with anxiety. So it's not just you. It is a system. It's not just you. So watch this. Your healing, you 
being healed, you caring for your wound is not just you. When you become healed, the people connected to you have an opportunity for healing. And those people connected to you have the opportunity to become the movement that rebukes the systemic oppression over a region that brings healing to a region that allows that region to open to heaven, to allow the kingdom to come from heaven to earth and allow the people in that region to tap into who God created and ordained for them to be. It's not just you. That's why this space is so vital, you see. That's why this space, that's why this event is so critical and so anointed. That's why the devil did everything in his power to try to keep you from logging on tonight. Because the enemy knows better than we know it that it ain't just about you. It's not about you. It's about the system that you are connected to. Jesus gives that legion leave. They go into the pigs. The pigs jump off that cliff into the sea. What does that do? That creates an economic devastation in that region. That legion of spirits were on assignment to cause damage to a region. And if they weren't going to do it through an individual, they were going to do it through pigs. If they weren't going to do it through pigs, they were going to do it through something. They had to complete their assignment. And I truly believe that the only reason why the, the Lord did not send that legion to hell was so that we could understand that point. It ain't just about you. You have to get your healing because there's a system and a movement and a people that are connected to you. Listen, you have to get your healing so that your grandchildren are not afflicted with the residual effects of your wound. You have to be healed so that the limitations in your range of movement do not create limitations for your children and your children's children. Uh, this wouldn't, you know, if I were like maybe 60 and my kids were grown, you know, okay, well, all right. Well, I'm losing fingers, child, you know. <laughs> I, I'm 41 and I got a little child. I have to pick her up. I need my limbs. What am I going to say to my daughter? Honey, I can't play with you. I can't pick you up because I refuse to be healed. <sighs> All right. Now, I said those two things. So, so you're going to have to do some work in that. To your cell phones, systemic wounds. Now, I, I really wanted to get here because this is where we're going to get all messed up. This is where we're all going to get messed up. <laughs> we have to deal with our God wounds. Genesis 32. Jacob wrestles with an angel. Bible says he wrestles with the angel and the angel, we, we, we know this to be a theophany. which means that this is a, an angel, but this is also a, a manifestation of God because the angel will later say, you wrestled with God and you won. It's a theophany, but Jacob wrestles with the angel 
And as he's wrestling with the angel, the angel touches Jacob's sock, socket of his hip, dislocates his hip. Wait a minute. God's touch caused pain. God's touch caused pain. I thought God's touch healed. <clears throat> I am stuck with this text because there's something very disturbing in this text. God to me, didn't have to break Jacob's hip from his socket. Didn't have to dislocate the man. God, why you do that? That doesn't make sense to me. That's point number three. Point number one, self wound. Point number two, systemic wounds. Point number three is God wounds. God, why did you do that to me? What do you do when you can't blame yourself, when you can't blame the system, and you can't blame the devil for your pain? What do you do when you are dealing with pain that is a direct result of your engagement with God? What do you do when you're dealing with pain that came because you prayed? What do you do when you're dealing with pain that came because you obeyed? What do you do when you're dealing with pain that came because you decided to stop running? Jacob gets this pain because all his life he'd been a trickster. And his past finally catches up with him. Esau, he learns, has come to uh, come out to him. And he hears that Esau has his army with him. And remember now, Jacob stole the birthright from Esau. So Genesis 32. So now Jacob's like, uh oh, Esau's come to settle the score. So it's so funny because what Jacob decides to do, he says, he says to his wives and his children, okay, y'all go in here first. <laughs> y'all go, y'all go. Maybe he'll be nice to you. <laughs> he goes send his kids first. That's funny to me. And then he says, I got to figure this thing out because I don't have another trick up my sleeve here. I can't lottery my way out of this. I can't, I can't, I can't payday loan my way out of this. I can't gamble my way out of this. I can't snort, sniff, drink my way out of this. So let me run to Jesus. And you run to Jesus, you go to the altar, you travail on the altar. And when you run to Jesus, God hurts you. What do you do with that? Many of us have wounds that came to us from the Lord. And we don't want to talk about it, but if we were honest about it, we're praying, but we're bitter. And there, there is, watch this, there is a limit on our prayers. There's like a, it's almost like there's a window to our heart with God and the window only opens so far. And the window covers the part of our heart that we feel like God wounded. We pray about everybody else. We can talk in tongues, we can pray, we can bind and loose, <laughs> we, we can lay hands, not in COVID, but you know, we can prophesy, but we can't talk to God about this over here, though, because that's where God hurt me. 
that's where God, I prayed about this and you spoke to me and now I'm hurt. And I got, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a fool. So I'm not going to say there is no God. That's not where we're at, but we're not talking about this. And so I'm bitter. I'm angry. I'm resentful. Watch this. Let's go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, Lazarus has died. Everybody knew that Jesus could heal. And Jesus is Lazarus's friend. Jesus, when he hears this, I love the way the scriptures tell the story. The Bible says that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was. I am a friend of God. You call me friend. Isn't it funny how God treats his friends? <laughs> I'm real close. I'm a friend of God, but this God, this how you do your friend? You heard, you knew what I was dealing with, and yet you stayed where you were. He didn't say a word. He waits four days. In Jewish culture, the Jews believed that when a person died, their spirit hovered over that person's body for three days. So if that person died, that something could happen within three days where that person's spirit could come back into their body. So at the fourth day, oh child, he good and dead. So when Jesus finally arrives, watch this. He gets to the funeral. Mary, the worshiper, the one who was always at the feet of Jesus, this is what she says to the Lord. She says, if you had have been here, my brother would not have died. Most of us have the God. How do you know you have a God wound? If there is a place in your relationship with God where you're stuck with him at if you had a. I'm, I go to church. When you're moving, I'm there. But God, just let me, if you had a, if you would have showed up for me, this wouldn't have happened. If you just been more clear with me, if you'd have, if you hadn't a, and, and the thing about it is, um, you reach a certain level of maturity where, so, so when it comes to trauma work, huge victory for me, right? Notice I, I said self wounds, systemic wounds, God wounds. I didn't talk about other people wounds. You know why? Because I've, I've come to recognize that most of the wounds that we experience from other people come from the residual effects of one of those three other types of wounds. What do I mean? Um, I realize that the wounds that I've experienced from my parents, the wounds of abandonment and rejection, I realize now that those are part of the systemic wounds of the community that we all grew up in. So now that I'm older, I see the bigger picture and I realize that they, the trauma that I experienced as a child was a result of the trauma that they experienced and was a result of the trauma that they, their parents experienced as a result of the trauma. So now I'm able to forgive them and just recognize that hurt people hurt people. So you reach a certain point of maturity where you just kind of expect it hurts and you get mad and you get bitter about it, but you reach a point of maturity where you, you kind of can understand Right, you can make sense out of people stuff, even if it's offensive. You, but you, you can still okay. Well, they they were crazy, or they were evil, or they were wicked, or they just didn't know no better, or you know, Aretha Franklin said, "I'm willing to forgive you, but I can't forget." You know, you can get to one place, <laughs> right? So you can deal with people wounds, but the thing that's difficult about a God wound is, but God. If you had a, and the thing is you could have. 
God, there's nothing too hard for you. So when you don't, what's your excuse? And it ain't like you, you can't say you couldn't because you can. You can't say you didn't know how this would hurt because you're omniscient. You can't say, um, well, I'm so sorry because I didn't understand because you did. You can't say, well, because this is what happened to me because nobody else hurt you. You ain't had no daddy leave you. You're the first and the last. You been from the beginning. So you you didn't grow up and you weren't abandoned by your daddy. You the daddy. You the daddy. So you can't even get up and say, well, you know, I was just trying to, you know, trying to figure out my no get God, you ain't got no excuse. And what's so funny is somewhere in your programming, you feel as if you don't even have the permission to admit this. But you got some God wounds. God has hurt you in an intimate and personal place. And if you had a... So, what I love about the text in John 11 is the miracle begins when Mary and Martha, in spite of their wound, knowing that Jesus could have been there, wasn't in the way that they thought he should be. The miracle begins when where they are, they choose they choose to open the tomb. Stinky, closed, forsaken, at the point where they had concluded that there was no further hope, they chose to open that up to God. The question for us tonight in wound care is can we essentially do three things? Number one, can we acknowledge, number one, can we acknowledge the type of wound that we have? Can we acknowledge the wound? Can we stop pretending that it's a sprain when it's really a fracture? Can we admit how bad it hurts? Can we admit how deeply it hurts? Can we admit how immobilized we are? Can we admit how desperately we've tried to perform and function so that people wouldn't think that something was wrong with us? Can we just be okay with not being okay? It's number one. <sighs> number two, wherever we find ourselves, can we open it up to God, even if it's God? Do we have the trust to believe that God can bring a healing that we don't expect to pain that we can't understand. Because many of us, we're so stuck receiving the healing that God wants to bring to us because we're stuck trying to understand why we got hurt in the first place. And sometimes our inability to diagnose is disruptive to our ability to heal. All I knew with this time, with this injury, all I knew was um, 
I have no idea what's going on in here, but somebody has to know. So even though this happened, all I know is I have to do, this is point number three, I have to do everything I can do to make sure that I get as much healing as I can get. Am I willing to do everything that I can do to position myself before the one who can heal me, no matter what it takes? What is it gonna take? Is it gonna take surgery? Fine. Is it gonna take a cast? Fine. Is it gonna take therapy? Fine. I have made it, you got to break it, heal it? Fine. Do you know why? When I made the decision not to get this fixed, I was 24 years old. I wasn't married. I didn't have a daughter. Had no idea who I really was. I had no idea what was at stake. So I'm like, I don't need the pain. I'll be fine. This time I'm like, you know what? I have a three-year-old. She needs me. I'm a husband. My wife needs me. I have people I'm called to and assigned to. They need me. I don't care what kind of pain I have to go through. I have to be as healed as I possibly can be. Watch this. Because healing is all about purpose. It's all about being positioned to be the fullness of who God has called and created you to be. That's why you can have a diagnosis in your body technically and still be healed. Why? Because healing is the ability to operate fully in who you are and how you've been created to be. So it doesn't matter what a piece of paper says. So I speak to somebody who got a diagnosis and the diagnosis won't go away. Can I tell you something? I speak prophetically to somebody or you're attached to somebody. Live your life. Because that diagnosis does not have more power over your life than the name of Jesus. Ask yourself the question, what do I have to do, God, to position myself to be who God called me to be, created me to be, and live the life he created me to live? Whatever that is, I'm going to do it. Can I acknowledge the truth of my pain and the depth of my pain? Can I open it up to God? God, heal the bitterness, heal the anger, heal the resentment. Can I name those things? And then thirdly, can I position myself to do whatever it is the great physician tells me to do? Deliverance, okay. Counseling, okay. Read this book, okay. Buy it for my spouse, read it together, okay. Yep. Get in a group, okay. Ask for a coach, okay. You know why? Because there's too much for me to do for me not to be made whole. I'm going to be made whole. Care for your wound. It's too much at stake. It's too much at stake. You matter too much to the kingdom to neglect your wound. You matter too much. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Jesus name, Jesus name. Whew. I'm going to release this over you, Sean. My hands have been burning for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> Itching to share this with you. And this young lady actually may be on here, the testimony I'm about to give. Um, she may be on here if, if, if she's not, that's okay. Or if she doesn't want to say who she is, that's fine as well. Um, but there was a young lady that I spoke to a couple of weeks ago. 
And she reminded me that I had prayed for her before. And in that prayer, I said that she was going to get a creative miracle, something going on with her right side, that she was going to get a creative miracle. And she said during that time, she was like, ain't nothing going on with me. I don't know what this word is about. <laughs> and then she slipped and fell down the stairs and she broke her arm. I think it was her arm, no, her leg. She broke her leg. And when she went to the hospital, she had x-rays. The x-rays showed that the bones were like this on the x-ray. And she said, by the time she got to get another x-ray, they showed that her bones were healing perfectly, that they were in who oh, thank you, Jesus, that they were in line perfectly. She didn't have to have surgery. I think she's in physical therapy right now, but her bones healed perfectly. So I release that over you, Pastor Sean. I release that healing over you. I release that creative miracle over your arm, over your hand, over your thumb, whichever, whatever the bones that are misplaced or misaligned, that, that the Lord is beginning to align them right now supernaturally in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will begin to feel fire in your arm, that you will begin to feel fire in your hands as the Lord is healing you supernaturally. Naturally. Yes, you may have to go to therapy. Yes, you may, but it is going to heal perfectly. It is going to astound the physicians that your wound is healing perfectly in the name of Jesus. We just release that creative miracle over you right now in Jesus' name. Oh, we bless your name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. you, Jesus. And there was someone oh. else on here that cut themselves. I think I saw that you cut, was it Chandra, you had cut yourself earlier today. We just speak a miraculous healing over you in the name of Jesus, that that just begins, that wound just begins to close up. And there's no, there's not even a, uh, Sandra, there's not even a scar left to show where you cut yourself in the mighty name of Jesus, creative miracles in Jesus name. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus name. There was somebody else on here that I saw. I don't know who it was, but you have put up an ailment. If you put up an ailment, put put it in the put it in the comments. If you put it in earlier, I believe I saw it. I'm trying to go back and find it. If you had an ailment, put it in the comments. Migraine, migraine. In the name of Jesus, we cancel the stress. In Jesus' name, we rebuke that migraine. In Jesus' name, we. These are lessons for life, like for real. Um, you witnessed um, a turnaround in my life. It helped me in my spiritual disciplines, helped me with fasting, helped me with forgiveness, helped me with um, focus and reading his word. Information that was shared was always top notch thought-provoking questions, those questions that had you to go beyond the surface of yourself and dig deeper and have Holy Spirit really speak to you and show you some stuff that you probably wasn't trying to see at the time. Thank the Lord <laughs> that he brought his grace and mercy and being able to come this far. You definitely gave us skills, scripture, mindset, uh, God's heart. I've learned that you, we, we can't do this alone. So that's what I'm going to miss. This is a constant working out our salvation and to be in a space like this, having accountability. Thank you for praying for me, for the focus. 
it took it took the busyness away being busy for no reason it was the real life application yeah. to what we're reading and the word and i love you and i'm thankful for this book and all of you guys i am on my way forward <laughs>